This week, Tenable makes a strategic partnership to ease authenticated vulnerability scanning. Avast announces a much faster antivirus engine. Risk Sense unveils cyber risk scoring that will model some other kind of scoring you might be familiar with. And Alert Logic goes into the cloud. All that and more. So stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Welcome, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island on the lines via Skype. I've got my illustrious co-host, Mr. John Strand. Welcome, John. Hello, and thanks for having me. It's good to be back in the saddle again. I had to, you know, my wife had a baby kind of thing. Turns out it was mine, so now we have to take care of it. It was... (laughs) It's, now we're outnumbered by dogs and children in the house, which is, is kind of frightening. But you've been outnumbered That's for some that. time, so and you survived. I've been outnumbered for some time. That's yeah, true. Yeah, I, I keep wondering how my sister does it. She's at five right now. Oh, my um, Lord. That's... And uh, she runs a very tight ship, but I, I, I don't even know. Like, there's times where they're like, hey, where's this kid? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And they just, you know, whatever. Yeah. It'll all work out. <laughs> It'll all work out. They find their way yeah. home eventually. <laughs> they do. So we've got a lot of enterprise security news to talk about, John, uh, as we missed a couple of episodes there. Uh, you were doing some teaching and I was uh, changing diapers and staying up all night, which is, uh, which is fun. Yeah. Hi- highly recommended. Which, which actually was kind of cool because it's like, you know, it took a little bit of time off and some really cool stories rolled in this week. Yeah, so indeed. that should make things interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Tenable has announced a partnership with Thycotic, which does um, identity management. And they're going to, yeah. Is it, is it psychotic or is it thionic? I, I've never quite, I've heard it pronounced both ways. I think it's psychotic. Yeah. When I first heard it, I thought it was psychotic. Turns out it's not. It yeah. is psychotic. And again, I mean, they're one of the, the like four major players in the space. And those of you that have um, identity management or identity access control, you probably are running CyberArk, Lieberman, Thycotic, or Beyond Trust. Uh, and it's interesting, all of the different vulnerability management vendors will integrate with one or more of those four vendors, Beyond Trust being somewhat of the outlier as they have their own vulnerability management system. It's one of the options that I offer to people when you know we consult with them, John, or I don't know if, if you recommend it as well, but I certainly say this is one way to solve the problem. And if you're into doing the privileged identity management and, and privileged trust access to systems, you should totally use that so that your vulnerability management system has access to all of your other systems in a very controlled way. And it's much easier, in my opinion, than managing credentials. So username and password I give to my vulnerability management system and then I have to log in all my systems. This way, it's much more uh, manageable, easier to expire, uh, and controllable with policies, which is what I like about it. Um, the other option, of course, is to put an agent on all of your systems, which has its advantages and disadvantages as well. Um, but this is one, one good way uh, to do it, and I think we're going to see more of these partnerships uh, as time rolls forward. Well, and, and I think you mentioned it on the onset. I mean, one of the most difficult things about doing vulnerability management correctly is not necessarily starting a vulnerability management program and doing external unauthenticated scans, but it's making that first jump into trying to do full credentialed scans into your organization. And that's where so many vulnerability management programs just fail. Um, and and the, the, the credential management is a huge part of that. Um, like you mentioned, okay, so you can use a domain account to authenticate systems. But then you really want to restrict where that domain account can access from, and you want to restrict where that the time frame that that particular account is allowed to access the network. And then if you're using SSH, you got to do SSH key-based authentication, got to import the certificate. It's a very, very difficult thing, and it's sometimes for many organizations insurmountable, and they just run away screaming. So this does actually make that process a lot easier for many organizations. Absolutely. Uh, this next, I'm curious to get your take on the Avast story, John. So they've unveiled, um, a, what do they call it? A, unveils a zero-second threat detection in a new high-speed version 
of their flagship product. Now, apparently, <laughs> in their testing, maybe, I don't think they say who's testing, they're faster than Windows Defender. And, and okay, that's, that's fine. I, I, so there's a lot of marketing hype here, but there's some stuff whenever you scratch past the surface, there's some things happening in the AV industry. Like, okay, so let's start at the beginning. One, it's faster than Windows Defender. Who cares? Uh, many people aren't saying that. It's like, oh, my system's running slow because of Windows Defender. It doesn't yeah. happen that much. I, I, th- I don't think that that's a very sellable approach, to be honest with you. Like, people just don't care about how fast their systems are. I think that becomes a problem whenever you have an agent and it starts interfering or you're doing backup or you're doing something like Carbon Black where it's fairly intensive or can be fairly intensive. But for AV, no, I, I don't think a lot of people worry about that. But if you read the article and you go through what they're doing, this is technology that's been around for a while, but you're now starting to see vendors implement it with quote unquote cloud based uh, checks, right? So, it, so with the cloud based checks, you have the standard AV. You're going to have a very small blacklist of hot threats. That this is how some vendors do it a very small blacklist of hot threats, the threats that are really exploding, the threats that are making the biggest bang in the industry right now. They're going to have a very small blacklist. Then they have whitelist in some situations. In some situations they do. But then if it's not on either of those two lists, it's not on a whitelist or it's not on a blacklist, then it's great. And they send it off to the cloud into a system that has a much larger blacklist than what's on your computer system. Now, what's interesting about that is two separate things. Number one, they can sandbox it. Some vendors sandbox. As soon as they hit it up in the cloud, they mm-hmm. sandbox, run it, see what it does. Interesting. And, uh, kind of like FireEye. Fire cool. Yeah. Yeah, but moving it up into the cloud so it's mm-hmm. not on base. Or what they can do is they can just do a comparison of a much larger blacklist approach. Traditionally, many of these vendors that we have tested, uh, we just finished up one vendor. Uh, we just tested uh, IBM. I can't remember what their product is, but they have something very similar that does cloud sandboxing and cloud analysis. And uh, we didn't even know it was there until afterwards. But that has to do with how it's implemented. If it's sandbox, it's far more difficult to bypass. But if it's, um, if it's something that's doing just a big blacklist, then it's pretty easy to bypass it because blacklists are dead. But all of this movement that's happening, you're going to see more movement uh, with McAfee, more movement with Symantec, more movement with the VAST, is mainly because Silence has entered the water. Mm. And Silence and their agent, and as far as that thing works, one of their big claims to frame, fame is it's fast, which is a better way to say, a better way to put it is it has a very small footprint. Um, and it's also wicked effective, far more effective than traditional blacklisting products that are out there today. Yeah, so will- you're going to see a lot more movement. I think you hit the nail on the head, too. I think people, as we've described, are getting that uh, agent kind of overload. So now the engineering and now marketing approach is to make their agent much smaller, moving that functionality into the cloud, which makes total sense so that people are more comfortable running their ed- the agent, essentially. And I think this overcomes yep. a, a problem. I'm not sure if it works better in terms of antivirus software on the market, but if you uh, find that it does, that's good. Tell us. If you find that it sucks, please tell us. And if we look at the uh, if we look at the evolution for those people that are kind of taking notes, you have traditional blacklisting. That's kind of what John McAfee came up with years ago. Mm-hmm. Then you have whitelisting, which is you know four or five years ago that started finally catching steam. And now you're looking at silence, and they call it their artificial intelligence engine. I, I hesitate to say it's actually artificial intelligence, yeah. but it's damn good. But what you're seeing now is you're seeing the next evolutionary jump in AV. You're seeing a lot of these AV vendors try to come up with a new approach, try to keep up with the new kid on the block. And that's good for all of us all the way around. RiskSense has introduced a new vulnerability scoring method that's based on the FICO score. And those of you Mm -hmm. familiar with the FICO score is your uh, mortgage uh, rating, right? Whether or not you call how much you qualify for a, a home mortgage, correct? Is yep. your FICO score, and so, they say it's similar. Okay, dude, I read this like I read this like I read this like two three times. I yeah. don't know what th- this means. So, since you're far better at vulnerability management, I read this twice, and I have. Oh, you still there, John? No idea at all. Like <laughs> what what they're basing it on? Yeah, um, I understand the idea of FICO. I understand the idea of vulnerability management, but what is the intersection between them? I am. I am. So here's the thing. Essentially, I mean, they're comparing it to the FICO score, okay, but the FICO score takes into account multiple different criteria to come up with a score that rates your eligibility for a mortgage. They're doing the same thing. I, I don't know how many other parallels are other than it's a similar model in that they're taking into account 
the vulnerability risk rating, right? The CVE, the OWASP, whatever, CVSS score, that's just one criteria. For some people, that's the only criteria in vulnerability management. So that's one. Then they're taking into account the IP reputation. And I'm not sure how they're calculating that, whether it's a blacklist kind of thing for an external IP address uh, or the internal IP address and its reputation, if it's an internally calculated thing, such as this system has had more vulnerabilities than other systems. I don't know. It it's, you know, remains to be seen what IP reputation means for them. Also, uh, John's gone. Hold on, he's coming back. Because you really want to hear this, John. Since it was John that asked the question. Oh, you back, John? Yeah, I am. Okay. I don't know yeah. what's going on. I think it's a Skype issue. My connectivity is great. It's just Skype is being flaky. Gotcha. Don't worry. So IP reputation was the second thing. Um, accessibility, like whether there are firewall rules around the system that block it from going to the Internet or the Internet getting to that system is taken into account. And then, of course, business criticality, which is you know, defined by the user, how critical is this to the business? And then from those four criteria, they're calculating a score. Now, this is good. A lot, some organizations are doing this. There's a lot of software companies that are trying to do this uh, for you. However, a lot of this requires input from you, the user, to say how critical is the asset, what firewall rules are around it, unless it can figure it out automatically, but it probably needs an integration to do that. And then they're calculating a score to help prioritize your remediation efforts. So this is a good thing. However, it kind of falls down because typically what I've seen is it involves a lot of input from the user, a human being, in order to make these decisions and come up with an accurate score. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Unless it's using artificial intelligence. <laughs> Which it's not. So. Which it probably, yeah. Uh, Light Cyber picks up $20 million in funding. And I, I like, do you know what Light Cyber does exactly? I couldn't really figure it out. It's behavioral attack detection solutions. Um, so, so basically, we've been talking about doing hunt teaming. And if I start cracking up again, please just let me know. But they do hunt teaming with. You're cracking up again. You want to try di dialing back in on the phone? Do we have a number we can give him? Yeah. Are you back? This is a train wreck. Yeah, I am. I don't know why Skype is dying on me. Like, I have full speed. Everything's fine. But it just seems like Skype is running bad. But, uh, but no, behavioral analytics on the network side, uh, this whole entire space of user behavioral analytics for Rapid7's product, Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics, and so on, is, is awesome, but it's expensive. I finally got some pricing for Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics. Did you, did you happen to see that email I sent you for that, Paul? Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were looking at that. I don't remember what the numbers were, but I remember looking at it. Yeah. $80 per person. That's typically how they're, yeah, they're priced on a per user basis. This Skype call is shocked. Do you want to dial back on the phone? Can we give Can we give John a number? There is a number associated with the Security Weekly account that he can dial. All right. So this time I tried a completely different network pop. Okay. Can you guys hear? I think it's better. Are you there? Yeah, I am. I just switched over to something else, a different network connection. Um, I switched over to LTE. So. Um, so, yeah, if you guys can hear me okay, I just basically said that LightCyber is doing that user behavioral analytics that we've been talking about quite a bit on the show over the past few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do agentless, which is really, really cool. Uh, so they can basically look at what's happening and profiling on your network. But they also do a network behavioral analytics, too. So the fact that they're agentless is neat to me. I, I think that that's a cool approach, and hopefully we see more vendors moving in that direction. So what are your feelings on DDoS protection? F5 just expanded... Um their DDoS protection into multiple layers around uh, the network as F5 makes load balancers and the like. So you'd think they'd be poised to do DDoS protection. I'm always highly skeptical of DDoS protection technologies because I feel like that at the end of the day, there's not much you can do. Well, and it depends on the amount of bandwidth you have, right? Um, you can have the best DDoS protection suite in the world, but if it completely saturate the entire link going into your organization, it's irrelevant. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. 
I think it's really good for keeping ankle biters off of the network and keeping like the standard skidiots from anonymous. Yeah. But if they get a good, good campaign um, that they're trying to take down your organization and they get a few hundred thousand people, you're toast. Um, unless, of course, you're like Google or, or Yahoo or Bing. God knows they have the bandwidth. No one's actually using it. So there are situations where companies can actually handle that, but it ultimately comes down to how much bandwidth do you actually have. In your organization. Yeah, I feel like uh, investment-wise, it's probably not worth it because, it, yeah, it might protect you some of the time, but if someone's really determined they're going to be successful anyhow, and there goes your investment out the window. Well, and I got a question. Let's talk about that from investment. I think that there's the enterprise security investment for companies to invest in a product or a service. But then also let's talk about, you know, financial investment. If somebody's an investor and they're trying to get, you know, to return on their investment, trying to invest in stock. I would say that four years ago when Anonymous was hot and heavy, Mm -hmm. um, investing in DDoS protection companies was a great place because it was in the news all the time. So it was driving the purchasing of these products. But right now, I just don't see it as that much of a critical issue in most of the customers that we're talking to at SANS conferences or at IONS calls. I agree. I agree. Uh, Alert Logic enables complete and continual visibility into AWS environment for Cloud Defender customers. It seems to me in reading this article, John, that they've fully embraced the AWS environment. I want to talk about that for a little while because I think it's so important to vulnerability management. There are so many different vulnerability management, even asset management solutions that are trying to work in the cloud. Security solutions in general, there are, I think, fall into two different categories, right? Some are just trying to like latch on and do like little small pieces. And I feel like those are only so, so have only so much like usage and effectiveness. However, it sounds like Alert Logic has really embraced the cloud and can really embed their technology right into your cloud system, which is the way to go if you're building out your cloud infrastructure or looking to deploy security solutions into the cloud. Well, and I also don't know what this actually means. Uh, we'd have to see what it actually flushes out as far as products. If you're talking about protecting AMI instances, I think that it absolutely makes sense. Of course, Cloud Passage has been doing this type of thing for a long, long, long time, mm-hmm. but they're focusing specifically on full-stack operating systems, AMI's virtual machine. Right. Now, the question I have is how do these guys secure something like Amazon Kinesis or Amazon Lambda or something like right. Amazon S3 and S3 Glacier? Because Amazon doesn't let you touch those things. We're never allowed to pen test those particular components. So we have yet to see any vendors. And of course, some vendors might have a, a kind of a relationship with Amazon. They can do this. Mm-hmm. But whenever you're talking about cloud computing moving forward, when you're talking about out of scale groups and all of these different things, the question quickly becomes, are they actually integrating with the core services that somebody like Amazon provides? Or are they just plugging into AMI instances or virtual machines? And I think that that remains to be seen. I think that these products are great for AMIs, but it's still that whole entire Amazon does all the processing, Amazon does all the data storage, Amazon does all the data ingest. Dude, we have no idea how that actually looks and how that works. Amazon's really smart. They have a lot of money, but it's too much of a model of here, just trust us because we're really yeah. smart. And after a while, it starts to smack of something like IBM or Oracle. I agree. I agree. Let's hope Amazon doesn't go down the, the Oracle or IBM route in terms of security. Although I don't think IBM is completely atrocious, but certainly Oracle and SAP have their, their issues there, right? Yeah. You know, it's pretty awful. Like if we look at SAP, um, SAP, Oracle, you know, it, it's, it, it's interesting whenever vendors like Onapsis can come up because your security is that bad mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, a company like Onapsis can be like, yeah, SAP security is kind of a train wreck. So here's a product to help with that. Yeah. Um, that whenever, whenever you see people spawning products around your product's ineptitude, that should be a wake-up call. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, that's kind of what happened with web application scanning, though. At, at, at some juncture, we started having all these web applications, right? I mean, we did from the very beginning. They were very rudimentary. But, of course, that continues to blossom over time. And now we're going to transition and talk about web application scanning. It's kind of the same thing. An entire industry was grown out of the fact that people were taking applications and moving them to the web, right? That was like the huge thing. Yep. Now it's pretty much still the same thing. There might be some mobile applications in there, but anytime you talk about building an application, there's almost always some kind of web component if it already isn't just a web application. Um, so this whole industry was born 
And if you're an enterprise, John, I mean, how do you recommend that people approach web application scanning? Uh, so here's a couple of things. One, um, I don't know how many companies I can handle with this, but because I really want Enterprise Security Weekly to kind of take off and hopefully people are like, wow, this is kind of cool. Um, I, I'd be happy, you know, of course, you know, if, if I have time and availability, please respect that. But I'd be happy to give any companies that are interested just a one-hour seminar on doing self-assessment web application testing with tools like the Z-Attack Proxy or Skipfish and Nikto. Um, it's a little webcast that we do, and uh, we, we did it a while ago. It's called uh, Pentest Preparations Web Application Security Assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but just the reason why I think that that's important, that particular webcast we did, and if somebody wants us to do some training, I'd be happy to do that at no cost, is companies need to be doing this. And, and, and then the reason why it's so important to me is as a pen testing company, we see tons of organizations that have rampant cross-site scripting. They have rampant SQL injection. They have rampant cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities. And about 80 to 90% of these vulnerabilities are vulnerabilities that could be found with a simple scanner, mm -hmm. a free one, like that attack proxy. And they're not doing even the basics and the fundamentals of what they can do to prepare for a pen test or even an attacker breaking into the organization. I mean, look, if you look at a lot of the breaches, that have happened via web servers over the past five, six years. A lot of them follow the path of HB Gary. A very easy to identify web security vulnerability was found. The bad guy broke in through that vulnerability and then wreaked havoc across the entire organization. We're not seeing a lot of attacks that are using really hyper sophisticated attack techniques to break into organizations. Now, of course, a targeted attacker will do that, but no, dude, they have to start doing this type of web application assessment on their own. And standard vulnerability assessment scanners just don't cut it. I mean, they aren't really designed to do that, um, especially post-authentication analysis. So you need to do this. And we're happy to help organizations kind of head down that path. So just, you know, shoot me an email um, at blackhillsinfosec.com and just mention um, Enterprise Security Weekly. And, yeah, we'd be happy to set up a call. Now, if I get a 1,000 people, please understand that we might be booking this out for quite a while. I don't think we're going to get that many people, but uh, we might have to do it in clusters and do it in chunks. We could do some webcasts, but I think it's yeah. Just yeah, we could do a simple webcast that's just for Enterprise Security Weekly uh, listeners. Maybe bundle them all up and then walk through it together. But this is this is important, and it's not that hard, Paul. You and I are constantly dumbfounded yeah. whenever we look at scanning results. We just don't understand why some of these vulnerabilities that are so easy to identify weren't well, identified before we actually got there. It's interesting, John. I, I put the tools and technology into three different categories in web application scanning. Um, maybe, maybe four, but so you have the, uh, vulnerability scanners, right? Which have some web application scanning capabilities in them. Uh, in fact, some of those aren't, aren't bad. They will find some of the low hanging fruit, some better than others, uh, in, in my testing. Now, um, then you have the enterprise web application scanning, uh, systems, right? So you've got the, uh, HPs of the world that make software, um, to do that. You've got, um, uh, our, uh, sponsor NetSparker, right? Does that. Uh, and there's a ton of other companies. I mean, there's Detectify, there's, there's cloud-based, there's application-based. Um, uh, what's the other one? They've got a cloud-based one and a application one. Anyway, there's tons of vendors in that, uh, like enterprise web application automated assessment tools, right? So that's kind of different from what's bundled in vulnerability scanners. Then you have some of the uh, more free or low cost tools like Burp Suite that let you do some automated scanning and some manual scanning as well. And mm -hmm. then you have, I, I think, more of what penetration testers do or web, you know, doing a web application security assessment. You use some of those same tools and maybe some different tools, but it's more of a manual assessment. You're kind of doing a little bit of automated scanning just to get a lay of the land, but most of it is automated if you do oh most of it's manual and if you're doing any automated testing it's a custom kind of scan where you're testing a parameter with some values that you you know and have, have cultivated kind of thing um, and you're testing sessions and things like that so those are really the four different categories of web application scanning I, I truly believe that you if you're an enterprise really of a, a decent size and you've got a bunch of web applications like let's say you've got 
three to five web applications or you have a couple of hundred, you need web app scanning in your, your software lifecycle or at least in your organization that's looking at finding some of that low hanging fruit in an automated fashion. Then I think you have to choose along what John's saying is certain applications that get a little more rigorous, more manual scanning with some of the tools that John mentioned, like Skipfish and Zed Attack Proxy. Um, and you kind of have mm -hmm. to balance that out. Um, but yeah. I, I think it's important that your QA and developers do some of this too, because you as the individual can't do all of it. No, not, not even close. But if we can take that, it, so it's the, more, the important thing is if you can empower the developers to do this as part of their development process, not as the security team does at the end, but you could give the tools to the developers. So the developers can learn how to do these tools and get this magic done. No developer likes to have buggy code. No developer likes to have a web application that's hacked. No developer likes to have an application that's going to, find, that's going to have vulnerabilities. Right, testing but they like to out. deliver code on time, though. They absolutely do. And we've, I think that we've found out that a lot of developers, once they get involved and they see kind of how easy this is, yeah. um, a lot of times the fixes are very, very simple. They're not that hard if you catch them early. If you have a particular yes. function that you're using as cross-site scripting and you use that function 150 times, yeah, that gets a little harder. But uh, it's easier to catch them early and empower the developers at the beginning of the process. But now, let, let's make it clear. You know, I, I hear this all, a lot, too. Like, they're like the... Someone will say, well, I just bought XYZ web application scanner. I installed it. I configured it. I pointed at a couple of sites. and like, hey, I'm doing web app scanning. Eh, probably not. <laughs> I mean, maybe. No, but no. It's not that, yeah. Point and shoot with a web app scanner is not... Um, is not going to be accurate, and it's not going to help you as much as you think. Certainly with a vulnerability scanner that maybe has local access to the system, sure, it's telling you definitively what the vulnerabilities are, right? Like, you're missing these Microsoft patches. Fine, that's great. Yep. But when we transition to a web application, they're all so different that when you point any automated scanner on the market today at it, I, you, you may find some vulnerabilities, and some do a really great job of doing that. But even if they do, it behooves you to figure out how to configure it for each application uh, and, and run those scans and spend a little time with it. Now, certainly, if you've got 5,000 web applications, that task can be daunting, which is why you need to incorporate that in your whole process to be effective. But I imagine if you've got 5,000 applications, there are some that have a higher priority security-wise than others. Yeah, absolutely. But if we can get that 80% out of the way that's easy, let's do that. Yes. And you're right. From that point on, it's tuned. It's understanding how the app, and that's ultimately what like, a good professional pen testing company um, can actually do. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so when do you make the decision, John, between running an automated tool, doing some scanning, more manual scanning in-house, and hiring a pen tester? Are those, like, three things you do in a row? And, like, what kinds of applications would you apply those different kinds of testing to? I would basically say the standard stuff that you can do is Zed, or, sorry, with the Zed Attack Proxy, or Zap, sorry, with the Zed Attack Proxy is... Um, that's something that should be happening every day with your developers, and it should be incorporated as part of your standard vulnerability assessment scanning. And I would say from, from that point on, you know, it's happening on a regular basis, maybe move up the ladder to a more comprehensive web application scanner, a more commercial web application scanner, and then at least like once a year, you kind of let the doctor come in and do a full health checkup. That's where you hire in a pen testing firm that's going to learn how the application works and kind of customize that, uh, that attack for that particular application. So that's generally what we recommend to people. And another weird thing is, you know, we, we, we love that people work with BHIS, but we'd say like at two, three years, it's really important to get another firm in to get a, a second set of eyes. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so you sound like, John, you've had success enabling developers and QA folks to use some of these tools effectively. I, I think I've seen the same success as well. I, I think... Um, I think that we have seen some success, and, and let me explain. When we've had customers that have implemented in-house web application scanning in their development core, their web applications become far more difficult to break into. Where we see mistakes arise is whenever they bring in a new developer who doesn't follow the process, or we look at uh, business logic errors that every developer is ultimately going to make. But when we see that work, it usually works with legacy developers that got burnt as part of a hack or they got burnt as part of a penetration test. 
and uh, then they want to make sure that that never happens again. And we've actually had some developers, when we start talking about business logic errors, anti-CSERF tokens, all of these different things, web application firewalls, they start going out of their way because the attacker is something that's visceral. So yes, it absolutely works, but where it falls apart is whenever you hire a new developer and they don't follow the process. Where it falls apart is where a developer decides just to get lazy. Where it falls apart is where they roll back a code base to something that was pre, um, actually fixed. They roll it back to a broken version. And that's why that continuous vulnerability management that you talk about so much mm. in Security Weekly and anytime you're talking in, at a conference is so critical because we have discovered over the past five years with our customers that we test every month or we test every quarter, we have found that it is very common for a customer to have a relatively clean report one month and then the next month have a whole bunch of just horrendous vulnerabilities pop up. So that continuation is so key. You just can't have it be done once a year. So what's your recommendation, John, for people that are testing homegrown uh, software versus off-the-shelf third-party web applications? Okay, so that's tough because a lot of the commercial off-the-shelf software that you purchase, you have some problems. If it's homegrown, if you find a problem, you can find that developer and get that particular problem fixed. Hopefully. It, and I'll come back to that. I'll yeah. come back to that in a second. There's an asterisk there, and I think you know exactly where I'm going. Mm -hmm. If it's something that's custom off the shelf, unfortunately, we have seen a number of situations where customers go to their vendor and they say, look, this, 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 this baby is ugly. This application that you sold us for $50,000, $60,000 is fundamentally broken, and the vendor just does nothing with it. Uh, the vendor just doesn't respond. They're like, thank you very much for your support ticket. It'll be prioritized and handled in the order in which it was received. <laughs> and, and, and that's frustrating for a lot of our customers. It's just vendors just not caring. Now, let's talk about the homegrown app. You said hopefully, and you're absolutely right. We have seen situations where we get an app that was homegrown. We test it. It's a complete train wreck. But the developer that wrote that app is, gone. Uh, is long gone. Yeah, that developer is long gone. And then, unfortunately, they show up to us and they're like, well, can you help us fix this? Oh, no. We have, to explain to them. we have to explain to them. It's like, oh, no, 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 we're not, we're not, that, we're not that type of firm. Um, right. We don't actually go in and fix other people's code. And then it gets really expensive right off the bat. Oh, it, it certainly does. I mean, anytime, I mean, I've, I've actually gone, I'm going through this right now with software for Security Weekly, right? Yep. Getting, you know, mm -hmm. transitioning through developers and uh, getting people to maintain uh, the code is, it can be a daunting task, you know? Uh, oh, especially where we have a developer in the past that we know had some issues, right? A developer that we had to get rid of at some point in the past. That is even more. Yeah, I mean, the developer for our website now is me, so you can see how much of a train wreck that could turn into. <laughs> Um, is John still there or did he it looks like John cut out try calling John back John's having some connectivity issues in, in South Dakota today which is okay we'll just bludgeon Skype into working to get through this episode I, I don't know why I, I, can, I can hear you talking to me this I think, time I think you have oh. a virus John that's what I think I think yeah, I've, should, got, I've got malware on my system. You should install this software at this link I'm going to give you, and then so I can gain remote access to your computer and fix it for you. Because <laughs> uh, you're you're a lead technical support person from uh, that's right um, from Microsoft. So. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk uh, a couple more points, John, about some common things that people miss when they configure an automated scanner for okay. web applications. Uh, I I think one is kind of an overarching thing that I think is, it could manifest itself into uh, different configuration parameters, but it's all in the same family of basically your scanner is missing huge portions of the application, I think is the most common problem, right? And there's a lot of ways in which that can happen, but that's the most common problem is it just can't find all of the functionality to test, right? I mean, that's really what it boils down to for me. Well, okay, so we have seen that, um, especially in one of the ways that we've actually seen it very, very, very specifically was um, where customers implement a web application firewall. They train the web application firewall to watch, you know, the 100% of the application. Two months later, they add 20% additional functionality, and the web application firewall completely misses um, the rest of the new functionality that's been added. I, I would have to say that that's a big place 
where people screw up. You know, they, they, they end up putting in a security product that isn't comprehensive. Right. And then when you're talking about crawling the web app to find the input fields, yeah, we run into a lot of situations where there's incomplete crawling of the web app. So coverage and then comprehensiveness on the defensive side are absolutely two things that are very fundamentally lacking in a lot of approaches and for the, trying to A couple web of those apps. things are, on the surface, they're easy. Now, it, it could quickly turn into a very difficult situation, but one is, of course, authentication. And that all depends on how your application is is authenticating users, sometimes that's easy to configure. Sometimes it's days of work in writing a custom module to get the web app scanner to successfully authenticate to the application. I've been down that road a couple of times, more times than I'd like to think about. The other way is just how the application is deployed. So maybe it's in a folder off of your web server. Maybe it's a specific domain name, you know, application1.mydomain.com or whatever and you're just not picking up on all the different instances of it. And so that can be a problem. You know, the other thing is, well, I'm gonna test this particular server, but that server has six different applications that are all called something different, either in a different directory or a different name, and I've only tested like one of them, and one of them is just the root site that goes to a you know index page that has nothing on it. Um, so those are, I think, some of the common pitfalls in web app scanning, because you can come back and say, hey, everything's great, but you didn't actually test the application. Exactly, exactly. Or you didn't test the right application. We had a test that we just finished up with that was very similar to that. We had the customer say they wanted X part of application tested, but then they gave us a, a clear instructions to go to Y, a completely different part of the web application. Right. And that's a tough that's a tough pickle. And I think that a lot of organizations end up with that exact same type of problem. So it sounds like, John, that everyone should do web application scanning in some capacity, whether you have a couple of applications or thousands, or whether you're a small team, large team, whether you're a developer or QA, active scanning plays a role, I think, is our overarching recommendation here. Yeah, active and continuous scanning is a huge part of the recommendation. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening to Enterprise Security Weekly. Certainly the feedback has been wonderful so far. It's good to be back doing episodes. We look forward to hearing your feedback. I don't have an email address just for this show, but you can email psw at securityweekly.com. Both John and I and many of the other co-hosts on our network will get those emails. So if you have questions or suggestions for topics, please email psw at securityweekly.com. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, everybody.